Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to enter into a time of worship now. Lord, we just thank you. We give you praise, Lord, for you alone are worthy, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for allowing us to be in your presence tonight, oh God. This is all about you, Lord. Just you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we honor you, God. Could ever come close, no thing can compare. Your eye living hope, your presence. And I've tasted and seen the sweetest of love. My heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Come on, we're church, we sing it with the hands lifted high. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and feel the
Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for bringing us a sense of peace, Father. Lord, you know that the storm is raging out there. And we know, Father, that it's forecasted to come here. And Lord, we just ask that your peace surround us all now, Father. Lord, that your peace surrounds the storm. Lord, we know that you can stop the wind. And Lord, we know that you can stop the waves. But also, Lord, I know that you can stop the wind and the waves that are in our hearts now. Lord, that you can calm the fear and anxiety that we're all feeling. Lord, that you can protect us and keep us safe, Father. Lord, Scripture said that you surround us with favor as a shield. Lord, you go before us and behind us. And so, Father, we ask you now just to move, Lord. And we trust in you, Father. And we say it is well with our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just supposed to do communion, not say that prayer, but the Lord placed it on my heart. So I appreciate you listening. If Brother Greg and Brother Lewis could come up, they're going to help me with communion. And we're so excited to do communion in our new sanctuary. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so reading over scripture, what I want to talk to you about is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you know, the letters written to the church in Corinth. And there's some warning that comes in that letter. And so before you come up and take the elements... I just want to share the warning with you. What we're told to do is we're told to check our hearts. And when we check our hearts, we're supposed to look for anything that may be an offense to the Father. And if we find anything in our hearts, we're supposed to turn it back over to Him. And we're supposed to repent. And we're supposed to watch as we turn back to the Father as He returns back to us. And it's scriptural. So if we could just take a couple moments just to reflect on ourselves. Father, I ask you to examine our hearts. Lord, and send your Holy Spirit, Father, to convict us. Lord, bring repentance to our lives, Lord. Lord, we want to lay our hearts wholly on the altar before you. Father, we want everything that you have, Lord. And Lord, we're willing to give up everything that we have to get everything that you have, Father. So Lord, just examine our hearts and bring conviction now. In Jesus' name, amen. So if this side would like to come and take the elements and return to your seat from Brother Lewis, and if this side would like to come and take the elements and return back to your seats, we would really appreciate it. Or we'll just form one line. Here is my worship, all of my worship. Receive my worship. All of my worship Here is my worship All of my worship Receive my worship All of my worship Here is my worship All of my 
chapter 11 verse 23 it says for this is what the Lord himself said and I pass it on to you just as I received it on the night when he was betrayed the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread and when he gave thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me let's protect Verse 25, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the covenant that you and Jesus made together. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be part of it. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be in fellowship with together. Lord, now just go and bless this word that Brother Jimmy presents. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Y'all can be seated. Thank you, Dustin. Hallelujah. Y'all glad to be here this, this evening? Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Looking forward to this message uh, uh, this evening. I know it's a school night, and I'm going to keep uh, keep you till about 7:30. So I have 30 minutes and uh, or so. So uh, y'all pray for me, Amen. Uh, just a couple of things I'd like to go over real quickly. Thank you, Dustin and and uh, Lewis and Greg. Thank y'all so much. I know they may have some in the back. I think they're going to take them to uh, the kids in the back uh, right now, but. You know, it's something special. Dustin said it about receiving communion, um, you know, for the first time in our new building. And I'd really thought about doing it last this past Sunday. 
And uh, please forgive me. I looked to see, and I didn't have enough of the uh, of the elements. <laughs> I said we're going to catch it uh, Wednesday night. So uh, praise God. Uh, uh, we'll do it another time on a Sunday morning. But uh, a couple of things I'd like to go over. Number one, I want us to agree together uh, this evening about this storm. I am praying that this thing will dissipate, that there will be a sheer wind or something to knock it out. We're not going to ask it to go to the left or to the right. We just are asking that thing to dissipate in Jesus' name. Tell you, uh, uh, I know there's been much uh, with the storms that have taken place. So let's join our faith. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name once again. We thank you for the authority that you placed in your body, the body of Christ. We thank you that you've uh, given us as the church authority to speak on your behalf. Nine, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chatelines, verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish, that's God, would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And let me tell you what Daniel prayed. 80-year-old man. He made intercession uh, uh, for, for the whole nation. He, he, he was at a place, you can read it in verse uh, in chapter 9, it wasn't old, poor as me, I've been brought into captivity since I've been a youth and now I'm 80 years old and God, you know, why are you doing this to me? Why am I picked on? Why this? Why that? He got on his face and he interceded and he sought God for, for his nation. He, he poured out his heart and the first thing you read in there is confession. He confessed, he said, you're right, God. You got me. You got us as a nation. We have been a sinful people. We have been a rebellious people. How many of you know the 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 first step in 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 uh, you know understanding that you've done wrong is uh, uh, to admit it. You need to admit it, and you know we got to get to that place in our own lives as well to know that uh, uh, what pleases God, and when we don't do it, we need to come to that conclusion, and we need to admit that we're wrong. And God's not wrong, but we're wrong. And so we see Daniel do that. Daniel was making intercession and confession of sin uh, unto God, uh, uh, calling upon him. Uh, and if anything, it's a, you can read the rest of the chapter and find this is kind of like a model prayer of confession and repentance uh, and also an appeal to God for forgiveness and restoration. We see restoration all over the Bible, amen? And Daniel is on his knees. He's seeking God. He's praying, uh, uh, and he's saying, Lord, we know why we're suffering. It's our own fault. Think about your life and the things that you may go through or endure. Some of it is self-inflicted. Matter of fact, a lot of, most of it, you know, a lot of it is self-inflicted. Come on, isn't that right? Am I the only one that likes uh, uh, um, uh, lemon-filled town donuts? <laughs> I tell you, through, through, this, uh, through this construction phase, we have been eating well. We have been eating well. We've had donuts. Matter of fact, yesterday was it Monday. They working on the roof, and uh, and uh, Robert has got a couple of guys with him, and I'm the only one here now, right? Not many, everybody else is at work doing different things. Well, one of the workers, his name is Tigasson, he pops in with a dozen donuts. He said, man, I brought y'all some donuts. I'm the only one here, you know. It's like, oh, man, thank you. So I ended up, I ended up having to eat three. I didn't want him to feel bad. <laughs> But anyway, you know what I'm saying, right? We got to be good stewards over this body, right? All the different things, you know, we, we harp and, and pound people for smoking and drinking and all that. But, you know, us, um, us good, good old Christians, man, we wrestle with that food, don't we? So anyway, back to this. This is a, a model prayer for confession, uh, repentance, you know, and, and an appeal for forgiveness. Now, that's what that is. Go to verse 20. And we're going to spend the rest of these 20 minutes on these verses right here. And, uh, and then I'm going to tie this to the book of Revelation. 
Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the, for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer that the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And all right, now verses 24 through 27, we'll, we'll read those and uh, expound on it. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting, hmm, in everlasting righteousness, hmm, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint hmm, the Most High. Know, therefore, and understand that from the begin going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolation are determined. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Hmm. Sound like some tribulation time going on right there. We'll get to that. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. Sounds similar to Matthew 24, abomination of desolation spoken of the prophet Job. But anyway, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. That ends chapter 9. Brother Jimmy, what does that mean? Let me just try to sum this up as best as I can in the 15 or 20 minutes that I have. Gabriel is explaining to, to Daniel uh, Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 years that Israel was to go into captivity, 70 years. And that's exactly in the natural what happened. They were in captivity for those 70 years. But Gabriel, not only is he explaining that, he goes far beyond Jeremiah's literal 70 years. Yes, it applies to that time because during that time, Jerusalem was desolate. The temple was torn down. It was in ruins. And in verse 25, if we'll read it again, it tells, he, he tells an, of, a, of a, um, uh, a promise of restoration, but also a Messiah. Now, we know that Messiah didn't come until Jesus is the Messiah, right? He didn't come for another uh, uh, several hundred years. So, so G Gabriel is actually not only talking about the 70, but he's also looking past that. And if I can say it this way, even looking past all the way into the book of Revelation. And I hope to tie it in with these three right here. So as we look at it in verse 25, Jerusalem, it talks about uh, uh, Jerusalem and the temple will be rebuilt. That happened around uh, 400. 445 or 441 B.C. That actually happened. And then the anointed one will come. Who's the anointed one? Jesus. And so now that's way past the 70 years. And then, of course, it goes on and talks about how Jerusalem would be torn up again, and that happened in 70 A.D. That was when it was, it was burnt. So when Gabriel, this, this uh, uh, explanation goes far beyond, let me just give it to you maybe, I'm going to try to break it down for you in three areas. Number one, it deals with the 69 weeks completed, being completed at the cross of Calvary. You say, well, 69 weeks. If, if you look at this and, and, and you study it out, these 69 weeks are actually, it, it, when it says uh, 70 weeks, it's actually the uh, seven sevens, or it's talking about years is all the theologians are in agreement with that, pretty much all of them, that we're talking not about weeks, but we're talking about years. And so when you, when you calculate those things out, you find out that this lays right exactly when Jesus comes. 
So the 69 years or the 69 weeks of Daniel that he's talking about, I just read to you, culminated at the cross of Calvary. And there's one more week left. I'll read it to you again in verse 25. Well, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness. And that ought to give us a hint right there. He's talking about everlasting righteousness. Who's going to bring that but Jesus, right? Okay, so now not only is he talking to him about uh, uh, Daniel about fulfilling the, the 70 years, but also about what's to come for you and I to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. That's Jesus. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Israel, and that happened around 445 B.C., to restore and build uh, uh, Jerusalem, that is. Um, Nehemiah did that, right? Until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That time frame is what happened from the building of what Nehemiah did all the way until Jesus came and died on the cross. He goes on and talks about in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. How was Messiah cut off? The cross, right? So can you see, it says Daniel is looking through a porthole of time. Yes, it, it actually applies to the 70 years that Jeremiah said they would be in, in captivity, but, but Gabriel's giving giving Daniel in a porthole of time of what's happening even today and what's going to come to pass. And so as we read in verse 26, Messiah shall be cut off. We understand that to be at the cross, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That talks about the one that is the anti to Christ, right? In verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. You know, as we talk about these weeks being years, the one week is actually a seven-year period, right? And so we find this one that's going to make a covenant halfway through the week. I don't know about you, but that sure sounds like a seven-year tribulation period to me, which we'll get into Revelation. It says, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out. So I look at this prophecy, yes, being fulfilled, that they were going to be in there for 70 years, but it also this, 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 70, uh, um, this the 70th week of Daniel is really, I believe, deals with the book of Revelation because the, the, the 69 weeks from when they started rebuilding Jerusalem until the Messiah was cut off, was 69 weeks or 69 times 7. That's your, that's your math right there. And so what Daniel is talking about in the 70th week of Daniel is really about the book of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. This okay? This is prophecy now. You know, if you, it, to understand eschatology, which is a fancy word to say the end times, uh, to study and understand eschatology, we've got to grab hold to Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27, and understand, yes, it was for the people of that day, the 70 years they would eventually, Nehemiah would go back and rebuild, but it also was a, a porthole of time. It's looking through a porthole of time to see not only that, but it also is talking about the, se the, the years until Jesus returns. And there's been uh, uh, the years from when it was rebuilt to the Messiah being uh, uh, cut off at the cross, there's been 69 weeks fulfilled in Daniel. But it's 70 weeks. So there's one more week to go. And that's the, that week, if you look at it, really means seven years. How many of y'all have ever heard of the uh, seven years of tribulation? Y'all understand that, the terminology there? Well, if you go to uh, Revelation chapter 1, I, I just want to, uh, first of all, just start off, uh, uh, don't raise your hand, but if you're scared of reading the book of Revelation, I hope this helps you. Because there's a whole lot of things in the book of Revelation that people get, whoa, scorpions, uh, this, demons, and a demon army. And 
First of all, let's look at the title of the book. And the title of the book of Revelation is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So I don't know about you, but that's a good thing to reveal Jesus Christ to be revealed to us. Now, with that said, um, I, I remember Brother Carl DeLatt. I, many of y'all know him, and, he, and uh, he's up in age now, and pray for him. But, you know, uh, the way in which he would teach the book of Revelation is uh, not to be scared of it, because if you are uh, uh, blood-bought and love Jesus, um, he, he kind of likens, likens it to this. He said, you know, it would be as if uh, a, a wife's husband went on a uh, journey. The husband went on to work in a different part of the country, and he was gone for an extended period of time. And as he was gone, you know, depending on what the wife was doing at home, uh, when she heard the news that her husband was coming back, if she was full of joy that her husband was coming back, that would probably probably indicate, you know, she, she was very faithful during the time he was gone, however long he was gone. But if if she got word that he was coming back and she got all worried and scared, it's like, oh, I, can't, I don't know, I don't have this. You kind of wonder about her faithfulness. Amen? And so when we look at the book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and if I can, I'm going to break this down to you it's in the simple form that I, that I hope we all understand. And I have about 10 minutes left, so I don't know if I've ever taught the book of Revelation in 10 minutes. But I think I can give you an overview of what, I'm trying to get across as it, re, as it ties to Daniel chapter 9 in the 70th week of Daniel. If you're in chapter uh, 1 in, uh, in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And it tells you those churches. Then John turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a gold band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, uh, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Here's the key. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are which you saw are the seven churches. My theology and my thoughts on this right here in chapter one is Jesus is standing right in the slap dab in the middle of his church. He's surrounded by those seven churches and he's right in the middle. I just read it to you. Jesus himself is in the midst of his church. I believe these seven churches are represented even today uh, in, in believers all across this land, depending on the condition of your heart and where you are. You know, there's one, there's a there's a, a church that he speaks to called the Church of Philadelphia. And you know what? He had no problems with them. As a matter of fact, he commended them for their love. But he also talked to a church of Laodicea, which was a lukewarm church. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one of them. I'll spew you out of my mouth. He goes on and on. You know what my thoughts are is that in each believer in their heart, uh, you could possibly be part of one of those churches, depending on where your relationship is with Christ. I mean, I know from, from my own personal experience as a Christian, I know that there had been times where I was lukewarm. I pray that I'm in the church of Philadelphia in my heart of hearts right now, burning uh, as, a, as a fire for Jesus, amen? And so I want you to see in chapters 1, 2, and 3, because in chapters 2 and 3, we find this Jesus 
is in the midst of his church. If you can look over here to my, to my right, you can see, you know, New Life Worship Center and what we're building right now. I can see in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus is in the midst of our church. We're two or more gathered. He's there in our midst, right? Do you all agree that Jesus is here by his spirit? He's in the midst of his church. I believe with all my heart what's taking place right now in the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 right now. I believe that's what's happening. And so as we look at this, he's in the midst of his church. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. This ties to the 70th week of Daniel. In verse 1, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, who would that be? That would be God Almighty. All of a sudden, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, we find that Jesus is in the midst of his church. And I believe that's going on right now. I believe that's happening. But there's something that takes place in chapter 4. Have you ever been to a, 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 a theatrical play to where you have a curtain and they, the grand, the opening scene, they open the curtain and you got the players in it, you know, and they're the, the, uh, the actors, right? <laughs> and then after that scene, they close the curtain and you get ready for the second scene. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, the first scene is Jesus is in the midst of his church. We're living in the dispensation of grace. We're living right now in the church age. And if you, if, if you can, if you can uh, 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 work with me a little bit here about this church age, in, in Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about how Israel will be brought back in in a relationship with Christ. He says that will happen when the times of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So we're right now... Can I say it this way? When Messiah was crucified, the 69th week of Daniel was put on, it was put on pause. And there's an indeterminate time right now before the 70th week of Daniel kicks in. You know why that is? I believe because Jesus is right here with us in the midst of his church. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, this is how this ties into Daniel. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, Jesus is right here. He's with us. In chapter 4, there's another scene that takes place. And look at chapter 5. Look at verse 5. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out all uh, into all the earth. Can you see what's taking place? Where is Jesus right now as I'm reading this? Where is he in, in chapters 4 and 5? He's, he's actually in heaven. He's actually on the throne. And so what I've seen is a shift from, from right here in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus is in the midst of his church to now I find the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's right there on the throne. And it says there's a multitude that surrounds him singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Why do I bring that up? Because I think what happens is there's been a, 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 a shift from chapters 1, 2, and 3. There's been a, a, the curtains have closed, and when the curtains re, reappear and open up, I wonder where the church has gone. I wonder what happened to them. I don't know about you, but wherever Jesus is, I want to be. And you know why he's here in the midst of his church? We're right here. But in chapter 4, chapters 4 and 5, he's in heaven. And I want to be right there with him. I personally believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe that's what's taking place. I believe what has happened between chapters 3 and chapters 4 is the church has been brought to that place. Now, to understand the rapture, I'm not talking about flying away past Mars or to another, to another solar system. I'm talking about, if you think about it, and, and I don't have time to go into all of it, but when Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples in a closed room. Thomas wasn't there, but he appeared to them, and they were amazed he was there. And then he left, and Thomas shows up. And they said, you missed it. Jesus was here. He said, I got to see his hands. I got to see 
And Jesus, what happened? Reappeared again. So when we think about this, and you think about two kingdoms colliding, maybe heaven just ain't that far away. Maybe heaven just is, is, ain't that far away. And the spiritual part in the, and where we are is the natural part is like this. So when we think about the church being called up, called up, called up and called up, we'll meet him in the air, right? That that place will be, will be with him. Does that make sense? And so as we look at this, we find I'm tying chapter 9 of Daniel into Revelation real quick. These, these uh, chapters, chapters 1, 2, and 3, I see, I see Jesus in the midst of his church. And then, and, and then there's a change that takes place. And, and I see Jesus in heaven. And I believe we as the church will be right there with him. Well, guess what? We're the body of Christ. You ever gone anywhere without your body? <laughs> your head just didn't take off. Man, we're attached to, our body's attached to the head. If Jesus is there, that's where we need to be. So as I think about this, and, and real quickly, and then to tie in the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, I believe it's all laid out in verses, in chapters, Revelation chapter 6 through 18. In chapter 6 through 18, if, if my theology is correct, chapters 1, 2, and 3, we're, we're experiencing that right now. In chapters 4 and 5, we're right there with Jesus. And in chapters 6 through 18, we're still right there with Jesus. Because through chapters 6 through 18, all manner of things are happening upon this earth. What you're finding is this sealed document that we looked at and, and just briefly read in Revelation chapter 5, and John wept because no one was able to open up this sealed document. It was sealed with seven seals, and no one was able to open it. No one was holy and righteous enough to open this sealed document. What is the sealed document that he's opening? Maybe it's just this, the title deed of the inheritance lost by Adam. I'll say it again. Maybe it's the title deed of the inheritance that was lost by Adam. This sealed document, seven seals upon it. Who could open it? It has to be someone without sin. It has to be someone that is righteous, uh, everlasting righteousness. It's someone that would be able to take this this official legal sealed document with seven seals on it, and who, who would dare open those seals except someone without sin, without spot or blemish, and that is Jesus. And he starts to, he t he starts to take the seals off this document, this legal binding document. And you know what the legal binding document, I believe, is, is saying? It's to restore what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. It's not only to restore that, but he's got to, in that, legally get rid of wickedness and sin and the devil. How is he going to do that? How is that going to happen? The dispensation of grace, I believe, is over after chapter 3. And I believe we're all together with Jesus, you know, in, in, in this time. And now... Jesus is going to return soon and very soon. Jesus is going to be riding a white horse in chapter 19. But when he comes back to this earth, there's got to be a, a cleansing that takes place. Got to be a cleansing. Chapter 6. How many kids do we have in the nursery? Uh, we got any kids in the nursery? I don't know. Just guess. Two. We got two kids. Jessica's back there with a bunch of them. Caitlin, your, your, your babies are out there. You're back there. Look, I'll tell you what. You know what? We just built this building, and uh, in the building, I don't know if there were roaches or whatever, but but these are these are foggers. Y'all ever heard of a fogger? And so since I have a fogger here, and, and maybe there was a roach or two in the nursery, now don't tell them, don't get the babies out the nursery. Just keep them in the nursery. And look, what I want you to do is take this fogger and go in there and set it off because we want to fumigate and we want to poison and we want to get rid of all the, the, the bad stuff that's in the nursery. Y'all with me on that? Would we do that? Would we do that to our babies? How much more does our Heavenly Father love us? 
So if chapters 6 through 18, while we're here and, and with Jesus in this place where we're, we, we've already experienced chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the 69 weeks of Daniel, tying that into chapter 9, we've already experienced that. And now there's been a different, there's a, a, a during this grand play, the, the curtain has opened up and we're all in heaven with him, right? With the rapture, you all heard, heard of that? But in chapter 6 through 18, there's some seals that are broken. There's some trumpets that are blown. And after the seventh trumpet is blown, there's bowls, God's bowls of wrath that are being poured out. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of the bowls of wrath being poured out upon, upon this earth? Jesus is coming back in chapter 19. Lewis said it. It's for the cleansing. And just as a simple analogy, we would never even dream of setting one of these foggers off in the nursery while our babies are still in there, right? We get the babies out of the nursery. If we got a problem, we get the babies out of the nursery. We get everybody out of the building. We put this on there. We hit it, and we get out of the building and let these things cleanse what needs to be cleansed. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation, boom. And when, when the dispensation of grace is ended, in the times of the Gentiles out of Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26 is fulfilled, what we're going to find, I believe, is the church, we're going to be with him. Wherever he is, that's where we're going to be. And in chapters 4 and 5, we see he's opening up this document, this sealed document. He's the only one that's able to. And what it does is it unleashes a time where there's a cleansing taking place on this earth. We don't want to be here, folks. You don't want to be here when the cleansing's taking place. God does not want any human being to be here when the cleansing takes, takes place. Satan will be here. Demonic entities will be here. There will be an antichrist that stands in the temple uh, three and a half years into this thing. And he will say, I am the one that you need to worship. And I believe what takes place after that, Israel's eyes are open. And when their eyes are open, they realize, oh, my goodness, we missed it. It was Jesus all this time. And then great persecution takes place and through those times. But then we find, go to chapter 19, and we'll finish up with this. Warren, you can come on up. This is all about tying this to the 70th week of Daniel. I know we're studying eschatology, the study of end times, which is Daniel 9. And if you look at it, chapter 9, the first part, he prays. He's praying for God to forgive the people. And then we find Gabriel shows up, and Gabriel starts to tell him, hey, yes, you are going to be restored, and yes, you're going to rebuild Jerusalem, and yes, you're going to rebuild the temple, and yes, this is the time it's going to take. And then all of a sudden, through a porthole of time, he's seeing the end of days. He's seeing the uh, end times that we're, I believe we're living in. And this is how it's tied to Revelation, that right now we're in the dispensation of grace. We're in, in the church age, and, and grace abounds. But there is coming a time that curtain's going to close, and the church, I believe, is going to be with Jesus in, in Revelation 4 and 5. And when he gets ready to open up those seals, we're going to be right there with him. And when he opens up, up chapter 6 through 18, all kind of manner of stuff breaks loose. The seals are open, the trumpet's blown, and the bowls are poured out. And then in chapter 19, oh, I like this one right here. <laughs> and in chapter 19 of Revelation, and I'm about finished. And after it says here in uh, uh, verse 1, And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. How many of y'all want to be in that chorus? How many of y'all want to be in that choir? <laughs> come on, you see, that's, he's still, you know, the curtain, he hadn't, Jesus hadn't come yet. His second coming had not come yet. I believe the church has been brought up to him. But his second coming, we're about to read in verse 11. Look at verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. 
And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in white and fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Are y'all going to be in there? We will ride like the armies of heaven. We will ride. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is returned. Hallelujah. In this right here, he's returned. And if you think you're going to be caught up and you're going to have to wield the sword and fight all this, your fight is right now. This is how we fight our battles right now. Because when Jesus comes riding on that white horse, he's the captain of our salvation and we're riding with him. All he's got to do is say the word. All he's got to do is just thank it. And demons have to go. And we're going to be right there with him. We're going to be right there with our Lord and Savior. And we find after he, it says he himself, he himself uh, uh, trounces the wine press. He himself does that. Then what we find is a thousand-year reign with Christ. In chapter 20, it says that we'll be right. Stand to your feet. In chapter 20, it says we'll be right here with him in a thousand-year reign, the millennial reign of Christ. After that, the devil is taken care of for one final time, and the Bible says the new heaven and new earth descend. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that great cloud of witnesses. How many of y'all want to be a part of that? See, Daniel Daniel was looking, uh, uh, Gabriel was giving him a, vi a vision and a view hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years uh, uh, before. And this happened. The 70th week of Daniel will culminate when Jesus comes back. It will be done. It will be finished. It will be complete. Father, we thank you for tonight's message. I pray that this made sense to all that were here. Lord, if not, I pray your Holy Spirit would just bring revelation, Lord God, into all of our lives, and that we would stay right on track with what you're doing for us. Lord, we read and see about the book of Daniel. It's one of hope that you, you have all things in your hands and under control, and that, Lord, you win. And we thank you that you have chosen us. We're with you. Lord, we thank you for it. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me my hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to dismiss the congregation, but if you're in need of prayer, come on up. We'll be glad to pray for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. In Jesus' name.